Welcome to everyone. The program today we hope will be enjoyable, a lot different than what it would be had we had a live conference today, but uh, we hope you'll enjoy it anyway, bearing in mind the technicalities and um, we hope we don't get any glitches as well. I'm going to start in a second by just talking you through some of the achievements of the last year, then hand over to Lee Corliss, our first guest. Uh, we'll then have a short break. Uh, then I hand over to Carly Jones, our second guest. Um, and then there will be a chance to um, hear about some of the things that our ambassadors have been doing over the last uh, 18 months, I suppose it is, since our last conference. And then we'll follow that with a little bit of looking to the future. Uh, and that will be the conference. So um, all packed into two hours this time. Um, sadly, we don't get the same interaction and networking that we would normally get, but we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. So since our last conference, which was in June of 2019, we've had six live training days, face-to-face -face training days. You can see all the happy faces there. 121 ambassadors have been trained that way, right the way up until February when we had to call a halt to our face-to-face -face activities. We then moved on to trying to work out if we can do the training online. And throughout the summer, we've been working on adapting the training program so that it is a virtual online training program. And in the next slide there, you can see that last week we completed the first online training session with a further 19 ambassadors. What we've done now is to break the training into two two hour sessions. We felt that doing a whole training day online would be pretty hard going. So we've break, broken it up into two sessions now. And uh, those are the 19 ambassadors that have joined us in the last week. So welcome to all of them. So altogether, 140 ambassadors since the last conference, which brings us up to 859, I think it is, ambassadors that we've trained. So that's um, that's pretty good going, really. So as you know, we offer the chance to go out and do talks for ambassadors. And we've had seven of those one hour talks that we've given over the last year. As I say, 859 ambassadors trained since March. About 200 ambassadors are still fully engaged with the scheme. Plus, we hope there's still a few more to renew. So not everyone has kept together on the scheme after the first year or so. But the thing is, we still have 859 people trained. So even if they're not fully engaged with the scheme now, they are still passing the word and the understanding of autism, which is so important. We're starting the plan now for 2021, which will be probably the most part of 2021 as online training sessions. So we're just sorting out dates at the moment. We hope to be able to announce those fairly soon. We've got the annual membership, which we introduced this year. As you know, the scheme doesn't have a, a dedicated budget as such, and we beg, steal and borrow and rely on a lot of goodwill. But with the numbers growing, it does help to have a little bit of uh, finance available to help us keep things moving and to run a conference like this, etc. So we introduced the annual membership successfully in, in April, and we also uh, introduced charging for the actual training sessions as well. And that has brought in some money. And I'm very pleased to report that just in the last couple of weeks, we've been given a grant by Hampshire County Council to cover the cost of Vanessa, our administrator, for the next year as well. So we're able to keep the scheme going, which is so important. Some of you who've been ambassadors for a while, we know that we've been talking about the idea of some sort of junior autism ambassador scheme. A small group of ambassadors have been meeting up until lockdown, and we have come up with an idea of a, a trial to try something out, an idea out about uh, junior ambassadors. But obviously with COVID coming along and schools closing in, in March, and it, it was just not possible to do it. So at the moment we have a trial planned, but until things get back to a little more normality, we're not gonna be able to try that out. We will give it a go as soon as we get the opportunity. And I can also say that, that all the partners in the scheme, that's the four local authorities, Autism Hampshire, South Hampshire branch NAS, and also Hampshire Autism Voice. We meet fairly regularly and all partners are fully committed to the scheme. So we're determined that this will go on, keep growing and growing and growing. So that's really the update. That's just to give you a brief introduction on what's been happening since we all last met. We do have two guests with us today and hopefully you've all had a chance to see Lee's and Carly's videos that they uh, sent us uh, 
about a month ago and we've circulated those to everybody. So I hope you've had a chance to to watch those and thank you to all those who sent in questions. Those questions were sent to Lee and Carly uh, last week. So they had a chance to look through and see what, what they were being asked. So we are a little ahead of time, which is good because I'm sure the, we want to hear as much as possible from the speakers. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Lee. Uh, Lee Corliss from JP Morgan Chase, who runs the Autism at Work program for for them. And I had the pleasure of meeting Lee earlier in the year at the Autism Professional Awards, the NAS Autism Professional Awards in Birmingham. And when I met him, I thought, here's somebody that would make a really good speaker for our conference. And he very kindly agreed to do so. So if I can now introduce you to Lee and hand you over to Lee, who's going to talk through the questions that have been asked. Yes, good morning, thank you. Um, and uh, apologies uh, in advance. If I do drop, I will uh, try and get back on. Unfortunately, like everybody else, I live in a neighborhood where lots of people are, are using the internet and we've had some problems recently. Um, I think particularly me and my neighbor, we spend, I think, all of our time on calls. So apologies if I do drop. Um, so yeah, so my name is uh, Lee Corliss and um, I look after the JP Morgan Autism at Work uh, program here in the UK, across uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa and into Asia and Pacific region. Um, the program is actually headed up out of the US. So my colleague um, who looks after the US and formally looks after the program globally um, is based out there. Um, I hope you have had time to uh, review uh, my uh, little bit of a speech. And again, apologies, that wasn't a JP Morgan usual professional. Obviously, during COVID time, I didn't have access to um, to our studio to be able to do that. Um, but I, equally, I do hope that you had time to look at um, our short YouTube video with three of my colleagues across the globe um, on there, and, and that sort of introduced you a little bit more to our program. Now, I do have uh, some questions in front of me, and I will get through those, and I hope um, they're questions that I get asked regularly that I will be able to uh, answer them fairly quickly. Um, so uh, please do feel free to to pop any more questions in the chat. Um, but if we don't get to them, I will certainly ask for a drop out of the chat and ask answer those questions for you. Um, I also have another role at JP Morgan. So um, my day job is I work within global technology and I look after diversity and inclusion uh, again for the uh, EMEA region. Um, and within that we have um, communities um, and I look after all of the uh, working communities uh, globally. Um, so, um, you know, JP Morgan takes diversity and inclusion uh, exceptionally serious and that's right from our operating committee right the way down. So the questions that I've got, I'm going to try and put them into some kind of, of order a little bit because they, they do, some of them do link. Um, so uh, I, I guess the, the first question I, ha I have here is how did the decision for JP Morgan to run the first autism at work pilot come about? So like everybody else, JP Morgan is always looking for for talent um, and a lot like a lot of big companies, the talent that we see is talent that we have previously employed. So a lot of people um, do enjoy the merry go round of uh, jumping from company to company, um, particularly if they're quite good talent um, and particularly if they're motivated by uh, by money. Uh, it's understandable In this day and age. People want to get the best pay for their skills. Um, so uh, we, we started to look at other areas that um, we could find talent and um, we got into a few conversations um, a bit a bit like this now. So we were at uh, some conferences and we got to meet a few people um, and the more that um, the, the people in the US at the time got to learn, the more that they they liked um, what they were seeing, the strengths and the skills that they were seeing amongst the uh, autistic community. So a decision from that was made that we would like to do something um, and we took a little bit of time to make sure we did the right research and engaged with the right people. So we did engage with a company that already had a program um, and we discussed with them the best way to go about um, setting up a pilot. 
and it was set up in the US. Now the US does uh, run slightly different to uh, a number of countries when it comes to hiring. So in a number of areas, when you are hired, you are uh, you can come in via a vendor. So you're actually a um, uh, an employee of that vendor as you come into the company. And then um, as things work out and things progress, you then become a JP Morgan employee. So we took our time to make sure that we find the, found the right vendors. So that's how we came about. And equally, we did see the statistics um, that are out there around um, the, the employment rates among autistic individuals. Um, and uh, we wanted to do something similar about that. But please be assured this is not a charity what we what we do here this is there are uh, a skill set out there that we need and when you talk about a skill for a role it is um very different skills to what you would uh, potentially think about so we don't go for the best of the best of um a certain role what we are looking for is skill matching what skills is the individual going to bring and and what skill do we actually need to partake in that role um and a lot of those uh, a lot of the the um the work that we do as you can appreciate uh in finance or tech is uh, quite repetitive so we make hundreds of thousands if not millions of payments a day um as a company, we process just short of six trillion dollars worth of movement every single day. We move about 35 percent of the world's um, dollar movements on a daily basis. So there's a lot of money going around and uh, therefore a lot of transactions need to happen. Um, and therefore we need a skill set of people who um, can follow a process very clearly, who can um, uh, you know, um, do the process over and over again um, and uh, equally have great attention to detail because those money transactions need to be right first time. So these are a lot of skill set that, that play into uh, people on the spectrum. Um, and again, uh, I, I hope I was clear in, in my speech uh, that I recorded. Uh, I am an individual on the spectrum myself. Um, and um, I just happen to be one of the most senior people to uh, to speak up in the organization. Uh, thankfully, we have um, other similar senior managers now um, coming forward and, and, and supporting um, the disclosure within the company. So that's how it came about. Um, with that, we then did support starting the Autism at Work Roundtable with the company that we uh, that we were working with. That company was SAP. Um, they were one of the global leaders at the time of uh, Autism at Work programs. Um, so we then set about uh, looking and working with SAP and SAP obviously had been working with a couple of other companies and we all came together um, to, to form the Autism at Work Roundtable. Um, so that plays into the next question of um, how we uh, got to know about the, the roundtable, uh, what steps were taken to help uh, make the decision to, to be part of the scheme. Um, and then the final part of that question around any hints or tips for influencing other organizations to follow suit, I will answer as I uh, um, link it to one of the other questions further down. So. We joined that that roundtable, and there were six sort of major companies that um, that wanted to to form that roundtable, and we wanted uh, to to form it in and the the fact that there was a, a lot of still learning to be done, um, and we wanted to to learn from companies that had a program. Uh, we all wanted to put forward um, what we did well and what we found challenging, and, and work together to find better ways of improving. Um, because whilst we are all competitors, we are equally out there wanting to support talent, finding um, jobs wherever that talent need come from. So we, we started to form this roundtable and the roundtable um, started off as an annual conference. And we come together and we share not only best practice, but then we share that with other companies that, uh, that happen to join. Um, or come along to that event and and it is a global event so when I went over to my first event a couple of years ago held at the Microsoft head office um, there was a number of UK companies there which was great to see so uh, they were coming over and uh, learning from us and um, the other roundtable members 
that round table has now grown. I think we've passed 30, um, 30 actual large corporations that sign up um, to, to be supportive. Um, and again, if you want to learn more about how to the companies go about setting up one, if you put in Autism at Work round table, um, it should come up and in there, there is a playbook that we've, the six of us have written um, to, to help guide companies. Um, the next uh, question we got is the Autism at Work Roundtable appears to be a US organization. Um, is there a possibility of setting up a similar organization in the UK? Um, and uh, if not, it's definitely needed. Um, it was one of my big challenges uh, that I wanted to do. Um, but originally when I was involved in this work, our, our company, it was a US uh, centric program. And I used to do uh, a lot of what I did, um, what was called side of desk activity. So I had a different day job that meant everything that I had to do was in my own time. Um, or if I did it in work time, uh, a number of the hours I would have to to give back. Um, um, it wasn't always the case. They did give me a lot of hours to do. So it was a challenge for me to do something like that. But um, we met with the National Autistic Society and they had a very similar idea that they wanted to do something similar. So unfortunately, COVID stopped that happening earlier this year. Um, but if you go onto the National Autistic Society's website, you will see, I think the dates are March 3rd, 4th next year. We are doing that Autism at Work round table. Um, the other thing that I am also doing ahead of that, so we have a partnership with Bath University um, and later this month we are doing uh, the second part of what is our BESA program. So our BESA program is aimed at university students and getting to see companies that have programs and understand what they need to do to help themselves to get um, onto uh, or into big organisations. Um, we are running uh, the second part of that, which is around uh, companies who have or are thinking of starting a program coming together and, and learning a little bit from Bath University and ourselves. So anybody who would like to come along to that, I know that um, Deborah from Autism Hampshire is going to attend. Um, we wanted to make sure that locally here that uh, um, we have support because uh, I work out the Bournemouth campus and, and clearly I want, um, want the Bournemouth campus, which houses just over 4,000 employees at the moment um, to, to be represented. So please do get in touch uh, and I'm happy to forward that. So I do agree, yes, there was a big need in this country to um, get companies together and increase the amount of companies that have a program that support not just autistic individuals, but we're widening our program now to make sure that we um, encourage neurodiversity. Um, if I move down then to the next question, I would like to ask, do you think that loyalty to the company may also be a case of wanting to stay where the environment, et cetera, is, is familiar and not wanting change, which is understandable, but could that work against progression? Um, and the simple answer to that is not if you have the right environment. So at JP Morgan, we're ensuring that our managers, um, where we have um, uh, employees who have declared themselves on the spectrum, that we have uh, the managers are well trained, well supported, and that the individuals are well supported, and that we work constantly on everybody's um, career progression. So we talk about what's next for them, what would they next night to do, and we work um, through, and this is with everybody, we work through where they would like to go. Some differences we might do with somebody on the spectrum is, and that we've done recently with employees, is when they were looking for uh, for that change, we let them go and spend a bit of time in that new team to see did they like it, um, uh, how was the environment? What what more could we do to support them with that move to that environment? Because again, it's about helping them to to succeed um, in what they want to do within the company. And when they move across, obviously we would like um, not only them to succeed, but the team that they're within to succeed. So we do give a lot of support. It's about building the right environment. It's taking the time. Um, to to build that environment and ensuring that um, there is support and structure, not only for the individual, but for the manager and for the new team. 
but back to I, I guess what I said originally in my speech is it's down to the individual how much they want to disclose equally. So we can only put all of that in place if they are happy to disclose fully um, or we will put whatever parts in place that they, they would like to help that progression. So I would say it's about having the right environment and if you have the right environment um, people will um, move on in, into new roles. Um, but I think you're right. We do have a lot of loyalty um, from individuals. Our retention rate is uh, in the very high 90s. We have not had many uh, individuals leave the company um, that are through our program um, at all. Um, we've only had a couple, I think, and for varying different reasons. When I look at our normal retention rate, it, it is nowhere, nowhere near that. So um, loyalty, I think, is there and once you have loyalty it's around creating the right environment um, and giving that loyalty back to the individual as well. Uh, kind of link question, how do you ensure uh, equity of progression opportunity in an organisation where all higher grades are tied to roles requiring individuals to demonstrate management and leadership which some autistic people often find much more difficult than purely technical roles? Now I can only speak for my company. So my company, we do have managerial roles that you can move into where you do not need to manage people. We uh, give people the opportunity to progress in grade, et cetera, in the role that they're doing. Um, and we also have a number of managerial roles that don't require you to manage people. Um, I'm in the, the very fortunate position that I, I manage people. Um, I'm in, the, you could say, the unfortunate role that I manage people globally. So I have to manage people a lot at the moment by, um, by telepresence. Uh, in the past, it was a little bit easier. I could at least visit, uh, visit uh, the team at least once a year. Uh, hopefully next year that, that will come to pass. But um, Again, it's back to ensuring the environment's right, that you're working with each individual and that the individuals have support. And um, this is a key that uh, so some companies quite not quite as large as ours of reaching out to the right support network. So uh, either yourselves to uh, uh, with the ambassadors being able to support the individuals and being able to support uh, managers, et cetera, and spot the opportunities to uh, to give them the support or signposting them where they can actually go and get support. Um, we are very fortunate that we have in-house support for everything. We have great in-house training. We have in-house occupational health. Not every company is fortunate to do that. So having that externally is really important. Um, next question, how do you convince senior management that managing autistic employees is no more different or difficult of a, an experience than managing anybody else? And that is a very, very simple question, and that is training. Um, because last year, what we did was we originally worked with an external um, company it was an actual um, a university came in and we put together a, uh, a full day training session around, um, uh, we called it awareness training and strengths training. Um, we took um, a lot of our senior management in the UK through that. And that was a big, a big ask, full day. Some of our very most senior individuals going through that training. Um, but what it showed them actually that if they managed by individual, there was no difference. And a lot of the people uh, gave us the feedback as we were going through the day of saying, well, what's different here? What are you telling me that's different? Um, which was a great thing. What we were actually teaching them is to not cut corners. Uh, management a lot of time is around wanting to do things quickly rather than correctly. And what do I mean by that is you will call last minute meetings, you will call meetings to discuss something, but not actually set formal agendas, things like that. So we made sure that the management structure that should be there was actually there. And we took, took it back to the managers and managers soon saw that actually all they're doing is managing by individual and that it's no harder to manage somebody on the spectrum than it is anybody else in the team if you do that. So 
quite an easy answer to that that question if you get the training right we now have that training down to so we have some online training that takes uh, 20 minutes that's global training it's on our uh, learning portal uh, everybody in JP Morgan can take that and currently we're working through we're up to perhaps just gone beyond 6,000 employees taken that um, and we are looking to get it added to uh, some of our senior manager training as a, a module as well so every person who gets a manager role will have to go through that training we also have classroom training that is now around 60 to 90 minutes long depending we do try and keep it at 60, but we do get a lot of questions. So that's great. So we we set the session for 90 minutes. So like I said to you, we, we're approaching now probably uh, the 10,000 mark of uh, globally, the number of people that have taken one of our specific training courses, which is a good number. Uh, we want more. Uh, we have some more uh, training that's going through now uh, that I took part in filming. Um, and uh, that is a training that has to be taken by every single employee uh, this year. It's part of their uh, essential learning that everybody must take. So every single employee in JP Morgan will have learned um, something around people uh, with hidden disabilities, neurodiverse conditions, and in particular autism, because I'm talking about it. So that's 262,000 people globally will have had that training by the end of the year. Uh, next question, what are the key factors in maximizing retention and reducing turnover in into autistic employees? Um, Maximizing retention is around the employee feeling supported, um, feeling that they're valued and it's no different to any other employee um, and ensuring that um, any conversations with managers are, are in, in a way that um, uh, the individual feels that they're getting the support. Um, and again, it's working with our managers to tailor those individual conversations. So they're monthly or weekly, however often they have them, one-to-one uh, -one meetings with their manager. Um, it's around a support network. So we do uh, set up buddies for individuals. Um, we have training for uh, their colleagues. Um, we allow them to go on external training courses should they need to go on external training courses. Uh, and Gemma Westgarth, you have so turned your camera on while walking, <laughs> if you'd like to, thank you. Um, so um, it's it's just around creating that environment for every individual um, and making sure that every individual in your company is treated that way as an individual. And even in a company our size, that is one of our biggest um, things that we try to work towards. Uh, how do you make the scheme truly international with JP Morgan? Um, I suspect most European countries, Asia and Africa, etc., don't have a clue about autism, um, even though they tell you they do. Um, you'll be surprised, actually. Globally, um, many countries do um, do understand autism. Um, and um, and we do uh, work with uh, a lot of universities in many countries. So as you will have seen, we are in eight countries now, and one of those countries is India, which actually didn't recognize autism as a condition till uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, so even in, in countries that are, are, are learning uh, about um, autism uh, as a condition itself, um, we have great traction, we have great support, which is, uh, which is great. And it's about finding the right um, support networks within each of those countries to, to uh, progress. And a lot of those great places to actually go and, and work with are the universities. So we're always looking for future talent, but we don't um, move away or shy away from finding what we call um, uh, already established talent. Uh, or experienced hires. Our experienced hire just means you're coming in as a, uh, a full-time employee at JP Morgan and you've left education behind. So um, we do find um, in a lot of countries that um, there is huge demand uh, for, for work for people on the spectrum and, uh, and a lot of those people on the spectrum bring great skills to what we do. So um, I don't think that we struggle but you know that's not to say that other companies may or may not we have a great ethos in the company we are able to work with um, and reach out and find the right organizations 
Um, how do you work with an individual who only agrees to limited disclosure on their diagnosis to colleagues? How does this impact what adjustments you can put in place? So we have uh, employees across the firm who allow us to to do differing or varying degrees of disclosure. So we have some employees who only disclose to us at the Autism at Work team. They don't even want their managers to know. So we are working with them so they are able to reach out should they have any anxieties, any struggles, and we can help directly. Um, one of the things that we really do try and put in place is buddies so they can at least have somebody slightly more local to, to have those conversations with. Um, if they are disclosing to colleagues, um, uh, then um, I think that in itself makes it a little, uh, a little more uh, easier for that uh, colleague to feel supported or for that individual to feel supported. Um, we have people who only want their managers to know, which again helps um, in some respects because the manager is there and able to support the individual uh, on a local basis. Um, and then we have people who, who do give us the full disclosure and therefore we're able to bring in people like occupational health um, and, and um, be able to put in place some reasonable adjustments uh, for that individual depending on their needs. So um, it is it is vital that you work with the individual and see what's best for them and what they want to do. Um, and we never push that individual or, or or ask them to do something that they don't want to do themselves. And anything they do uh, want to do, we offer full support throughout that process of whatever they want to do, whether that be disclosing to their manager, to their team, to occupational health, whatever it is, we're there to support them. And quite often uh, our buddies do accompany them uh, through those conversations. Uh, have you had to put additional things in place for autistic staff who have had to work from home and how have they coped uh, with home working? Like everybody else, uh, people either like working at home or they don't. With a, a number of autistic individuals, a lot of them like the routine of getting up, going to the office and having that distinction. I'm one of those from the start. Um, having, uh, you know, working from home and having a room in my house where I was working from all day and then not actually feeling that I'd ever gone home. So my home suddenly started feeling like my workplace was a challenge. Um, uh, and a number of colleagues had that. So, uh, you know, I was helped and I helped others to, to establish routines that, that made that, um, that break um, or distinction appear. So um, instead of having my car journey home now, what I do at the end of the day is I go go for a walk um, and break that and make that feel that that's my car journey home. Um, for others, um, we needed to, so I had already noise cancelling headphones uh, in the office. I was able to bring them home. So um, we were able to give the technology to any individual that needed it at home. Um, whether that be noise cancelling headphones, whether that be um, uh, dual monitors, we even supported if they um, had a bit of an old laptop that didn't have a camera, etc. We were able to get them them laptops. We're a large company that we're aware that not every company can do that, but things like noise cancelling headphones to enable uh, concentration into meetings, etc., or cut out the noise everywhere else. These are not expensive. Um, so um, we're able to provide that for, for employees should they require them. We also offered the same level of support um, and encouragement. We still encourage the um, time away from a computer, ensuring that they still had the same structure to their day. We uh, ensure that they were still um, st starting their day when they did in the office and ending it when they did in the office as well. So there was structure to their routine that people weren't getting drawn into the working longer hours at home. Um, so there was a question here of uh, have you had any feedback about the preparing for interview uh, video on our YouTube um, and how it helps people prepare? Um, now I have happened to find that one on our uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. We do have a number of those. We haven't actually produced one for the Autism at Work program. Um, we do do a lot of uh, going out into into the universities. Uh, we're getting into more schools around 
how to prepare for interviews, etc. We're working closely now with the National Autistic Society um, in in getting together um, their Autism at Work program around uh, the interview process. We've made a lot of adaptations and training to our managers, but when we make an adaptation, we don't just make it for anybody coming in on the spectrum, we make it for everybody. Uh, and that means we're able to give a better experience for even those that choose not to disclose. Um, so um, those videos are, are important because the questions are still there and it's still around, you know, ensuring that you have uh, uh, researched the company um, and that you uh, know the role that you're going for and, and how your skills are matched. Um, but I think uh, as a company, we our next step is to to do something on the autism spectrum one, but they're still good um, uh, YouTube videos around preparing yourself for an interview because um, a lot of companies haven't made the adaptations that we have. So you need to be prepared. And I think, um, you know, anything like that is always good to watch. Um, how important do you think uh, it is that autistic people are involved in running and managing autism at work programs and that mentors are autistic themselves? Uh, we are unique uh, in the autism at work round table that um, our program happens to have somebody on the spectrum in one of the senior roles in myself. Um, a number of the, the companies that we work with don't have people um on the spectrum in those senior roles but to be successful they have always included uh run uh focus groups etc including people on the spectrum and that is key um getting that feedback understanding um from from individuals what it what you know what will work what won't work um etc is is key to the success um, if you don't have in-house, then obviously it's great to to be able to go to local support, not for profits, National Autistic Society, Autism Hampshire, to to get that advice and support. It is really key if you're going to be doing that. Um, and um, uh, you know, and when it comes to buddies uh, in an organisation our size, it is not always possible that the the local buddy is somebody who's on the spectrum. At a minimum, we insist that they've completed the classroom training, um, not just the online training. Uh, and that buddy will also have the support of um, more than likely, if it's the UK, me to 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 uh, come and ask questions or guidance or support from. Um, I unfortunately cannot be the buddy to everybody in the UK and EMEA. And if you watch the YouTube video, Kim, who uh, does a lot of support, who is one of our my featured colleagues in there, um, equally cannot be um, a, a buddy to everybody. Um, uh, she is um, uh, very much a buddy to a lot of individuals, particularly a lot of our female uh, members of staff um, who want to understand her experience uh, of uh, how she's progressed. Um, as Kim in that video was one of our first uh, UK uh, people to actually be promoted within the company into uh, a managerial position, um, having worked for the company for two or three years and with the sport, the autism program has progressed her career, which is great. Uh, I think the final question here, how do you reach uh, and advertise to autistic people? Um, I will uh, at the last question, which is pretty timely as David's telling me to speed up. Um, uh, this is, this is the one problem that we found. There was no one central place to go to find um, autistic talent. Um, it was a, a challenge to start off with. So we did run a, a number of sessions in house um, and did a lot of local advertising. Um, we are now partnering with the National Autistic Society um, and they have an autism at work uh, page uh, where jobs are able to go up there. Um, we have to be like any other company when you are uh, uh, advertising any role, it is open to everybody. But what we are trying to do there is is put roles that we uh, that we um, think 
are, are well suited and well aligned uh, that we've done substantial training in that area so uh, we feel that they are more suitable than perhaps some of our other roles all of our roles are very suitable but we are actually at a position um, to uh, to for that individual to feel um, comfortable to apply what we are actually also doing is uh, we have a, an area within our bank called force for good where we actually uh, support local not-for-profits um, whether that be in country or globally, and we help them on a, a specific project. So we're currently just kicking off supporting them over the next seven, eight months, building um, a better solution, um, a tech solution. So we we do this, that's why it's called Force for Good. We do this free of charge. We build the technology um, for, for the individuals and National Autistic Society put in a bid and they were chosen. And we're working very closely to see how we can create a better central repository that gives great support for individuals looking for work, um, directs them, guides them to where they need to go, uh, for uh, any additional support um, can hopefully um, align them to job coaches uh, or more local support where they live. Equally on the back end of that, um, it um, is helping employers get themselves ready and when they do advertise their roles, um, it, we can uh, provide perhaps some job matching. So that is a piece of work that's just starting that we are wanting to support. We're trying, um, you know, as much as we can to start to direct people to start doing their own research into companies. And we're starting um, as young as we possibly can. So again, this year we should have done um, or, or kicked off cyber camps, getting into schools, school age children. Uh, we will be doing it virtually next year. Um, so uh, children on the spectrum who are thinking about uh, any kind of career in technology can uh, look up and join one of these uh, camps, a week long camp where they get to see what it takes to work in a technology company, what you perhaps might need to, um, to take at school, what you might need to concentrate or focus on and what support is out there. We're running that in conjunction with the National Autistic Society. Um, we will be doing that across our three campuses throughout next year. Um, and that will hopefully um, start to feed uh, the pipeline for future technologists into not just our company, but other companies as well. So a uh, bit of a whistle stop through the 13 questions. Um, appreciate that uh, it would have been easier should you be able to ask them in, in person, but I hope you got a bit of a flavor for, for what we're doing and, and, and what more needs to be done across more companies. Once again, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for giving your time um, to pre-record your video and to be with us today. So thank you very much indeed. And it's great to hear that the work you're doing. Um, it's very much needed and it's great to know you're taking hold of it and making it, making it work, which is brilliant. So thank you very much, Lee. It's my great pleasure to introduce our second guest, Carly Jones. And uh, You've all heard, I hope, have all heard her first uh, video that she pre-recorded for us. We've had a, a, quite a number of questions come in for Carly as well. So over to you, Carly. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, we are still in morning just about, aren't we? Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, just before I start, I want to say a massive hats off to Lee. Um, I met Lee very briefly in February when I awarded him uh, an award on behalf of the National Autistic Society Professional Conference. So we have met before Lee very briefly, but I think there was a lot of booze involved in that night because it was a bit of a celebratory time, but um, well deserved. And I, I really enjoyed listening to you, Lee. It was brilliant. Um, so yes, hello, I'm Carly. Thank you for um, persevering with my video, which I sent, which had my dog being very naughty in the background. So I, I apologize for that, the uh, naughtiest assistance dog in training in the world. Um, I'm really grateful for the questions that I've been, that have been submitted to me, um, because actually they're, they're all the subjects that I like to talk a lot more about and, and kind of expand on. So um, without further ado, I'll read out the questions and, um, and then give an answer. So um, the question number one was masking is often associated with autistic women and girls, although not all. Do you think that your acting is linked to this? And do you think that masking delayed your diagnosis? 
if possible, some examples of masking. So, um, so yes, I think masking is um, is a bit of a, a double-edged sword, as, as they call it. There, there are very positive things about the um, the ability to mask, acting being one of them. And um, it's very quick for me to read a script, see what's going on in in a in a film sense or a TV sense, and and be able to just deliver it. Um, and I'm often touch wood word perfect on on scripts as well because um I'm, I'm quite good at remembering those sort of things um so yes masking can really help when it comes to things like that masking is also very difficult um throughout your life so so the, the advantages of it um there are also disadvantages so um it, it can it, it's a bit like, and I often say this, and I probably get told off for saying it, but I don't know how else to describe it. It's a bit like tofu. I don't know if people eat tofu, but tofu, um, whatever you put it in, it becomes. <laughs> and I often feel like um, myself and the autistic girls that I support um, are a bit like tofu. You know, if put us into one social situation, and we will become that. So if if you're a young person, or indeed yourself as an autistic woman, adult. Is, um, is surrounded by good people and people that mean well, um, that's going to really help. But also similarly, um, particularly in the teenage years, if you're surrounded by people that don't have your best interests at heart, we might end up masking and copying, not because we agree with what someone's doing, um, purely because it's, it's, I need to survive. I'm, I'm almost like being on remote. That's how it felt for me growing up, being on remote. Um, and and you kind of lose your own personal ethics slash boundaries in that kind of situation because you're just trying to fit in and survive. And I think actually masking is is a it, after many years becomes um, almost you know you might not be aware that you're doing it, and it might be afterwards that you think oh gosh I was just trying to go along with everyone else. Um, and as as an adult, um, you know it's 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 easier to go no these are my rules for my life um, and, and it's easier to have that agency to leave a situation but when you're a young girl and you're in a school you can't just go actually I don't want to do this I'm going home you're at school you know it's much harder as an adult you can just get in the car and drive off or hop on the train and leave but as, as a young as a young girl that's a lot harder it's also harder on parents I think because if um, I mean we do mask at school so the teachers will often see um, uh, a young woman or indeed boy, boys mask too, it's just more kind of associated with, with autistic women and girls. It might be the case that the teachers really don't see the challenges um, and distress that an autistic student's having um, because at school they're blending in, they're fitting in, but it's 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 almost been kind of a quite peripheral um, because it might be well, like you know, can fit in for maybe four or five minutes per clique. Everyone has these cliques, which I still don't understand at thirty-eight. Um, and you sit, you're seemingly fitting in, but actually, it's a bit like being a ping pong. Um, and and when you get home, all of that tension, upset, and frustration of the day is going to come out the minute that you get home because that's your safe place, and um, and that that leaves to teachers and, and parents having a really tricky time because the, the child that the teacher's seeing is completely different to the, the, the young woman that, that the parents are seeing. So often parents get blamed a lot, get told to go on parenting courses um, and all these kind of things like, well, you know, we're doing our best. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's quite tricky. It's also hard for um, the diagnosis point of view, literally in the clinician's room, because if you mask in um, situations which feel a bit alien to you or situations you feel anxious in, actually going to a clinician is really alien, going uh, and, and a, a huge time of anxiety, you're going to mask in the clinician's room, which means even the clinician, unless they're really clued up on autism, women and girls, and excellently clued up on masking, aren't going to see that autistic individual. They're going to see the person that the autistic individual, individual thinks they need to be for that setting. And that's incredibly tough, incredibly tough for, for not only the family, the young women, but also the clinician themselves to kind of see past that. Um, there are 
great diagnosis tools just such as uh, the DISCO. Not a party, I'm afraid, but it's called the DISCO. It's an acronym, um, which I will forget if I try to reel it off, so I won't bother. Um, it's, it's on Google, um, but, but that's quite good because it might say, oh, OK, um, do you have a lot of friends? And if uh, a young girl was to go, oh, yes, I've got like 3,000 friends. They might be talking about Facebook friends. They might be talking about, um, you know, Instagram, all those kind of things. Um, the second question after that is, the last time you were unwell, who came to visit you? And then you're getting to see a much broader life experience rather than the person that the autistic woman is presenting in the cl clinical setting. Um, I have some examples of masking. Uh, I, I can remember at one of my earliest memories was being at preschool and everyone was kind of running around and I didn't really know what to do. So I'm kind of three or four at this point. So it wasn't like I was masking, um, you know, at, it, it wasn't like it just started happening as a teenager. And I can remember just pretending to make phone calls and things like that. Quite, quite odd, I guess, to compared to the other kids. Um, and my parents, when I was about five or six, on a Saturday night, we'd always go and get Chinese. And um, our, my dad would drive to, to the Chinese takeaway and we'd pick up our takeaway. And, uh, and I got banned from going um, because I would mask. I noticed that the, um, the chefs that worked at the, at the Chinese takeaway would um, speak to my dad in English, but then they would speak to each other um, in Chinese. So I um, took it upon myself to try and speak Chinese to them because I thought that was the polite thing to do. But of course, to everyone else in the packed waiting room on a Saturday night, I looked like I was, you know, mocking them. I, and I looked like I was um, trying to be hilarious, but I wasn't. I was trying to be polite because I thought, actually, that can't be very good for them having to always try and speak English. So I got banned and my parents were terribly embarrassed because I was never allowed to go and, and get the, pick up the Chinese anymore. So I was obviously masking then, trying to blend in, watching what was going on. Um, even with conferences, we won't see this today because obviously we're online, but I like to be early for everything. Um, and I like to be early, not, <laughs> not because I'm a particularly organised person, um, because if, if you're early, you can see the... I don't understand the tone, so I have to guess the tone. And there's no better way to guess the tone of an event than to just watch for at least an hour. I've been known to arrive to a com for a conference the night before and stayed over at the hotel and, and then been like the first there, watching everything get set up. And I'm, I, I always seem overly helpful. Um, because I'm early, oh, let me do the tables, let me do this. And it's because I'm trying to, 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 to gauge the tone of a situation. So if people are more relaxed, say jeans and a jumper, you know, it's going to be a bit, bit more informal. If everyone's in suits and shaking hands rather than hugging, although we can't hug now, that's going to that's gonna be a tricky one when we go back. I won't be able to read the tone. Um, I, I, I kind of guess how I'm, well, the professional that they want me to be, who have they hired? Um, uh, it's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting and it's the sort of thing where you go home and then you need to be in a bit of a dark room and then you might wake up at three o'clock in the morning quite literally remembering everything you said and everything other people said to you and then wondering if you got it right. Um, I, I try very hard not to mask now um, but sometimes I just don't realise I'm doing it. Um, um, so that, that can be quite, quite tricky. Um, I notice that my voice changes when I'm masking a lot. So I've got quite a proud Bracknell accent, which sounds a bit cockney, but it's not. Bracknell's where I was raised and it's a, a new town. By new, I mean like 1950s-ish. Um, and, and it was built to house lots of people that came from the East End. So um, when, when obviously overcrowding everything in London. So, um, so lots of us have this, what we call a mockney accent. And that is my, the natural way of that I talk. Um, but you might find particularly, I even see it when I see YouTube videos and I think, oh, I'm starting to talk a bit like that. <laughs> and I think, oh, I don't even talk like that. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite funny. And actually, lockdown's proven um, and, and obviously working from home, that's been very interesting. Um, I was obviously surrounded by very posh people in the last year or two because I found my natural accents come back, which I'm very proud of. And I hope I don't erode it away again. So uh, question two. When you're having a difficult time, what's the best thing someone can do to help? Um, and then in common says appreciating this is different for every person. For me, um, believe it or not, I'm a complete chatterbox. Public speaking is literally my job, but I'm not always verbal. I, I do go non-verbal. 
Um, a, a good example of this was about a year or so ago, I became unwell and I couldn't talk. And my daughter, who's 22, actually had to be my advocate. She's she's not autistic. She was my advocate, and she um, I had to be, had to go to hospital in a in an ambulance, and and I couldn't say anything at all. And it was quite interesting to see the reaction of the medical staff. So also they'd see me go in as somebody that absolutely could not speak. I was trying to speak, and every time I I tried, I was sick and. I was really not well and um and they said that that's the person they saw when I came in and the person they saw kind of four or five hours later once I'd had the right pain relief and and uh and and was okay <laughs> they, they were a bit shocked to say the least because it's the person that went in isn't the same person that went out um so so what I need in that time is I need people to speak for me because I won't be able to do it myself often um and if it's not something as serious as that, but I just need to have some time alone, um, it is a case of a nice dark room, um, blankets, weighted blankets are nice, sensory things, which I find a comfort. So again, with sensory, some things can be terrible for me, such as bright lights. Um, but I find a lot of comfort in, you know, kind of furry things, probably where I've got two cats and a dog, um, <laughs> kind of that furry or fake fur material. I've been known, particularly if it's an awards due or something and I'm late getting there and I'm in a cab, I've been known to purposely either have like a fake fur handbag or a fake fur scarf and I'll take it off, kick my heels off and then rub my feet on it in the in the taxi and the taxi drivers must think I'm a bit odd. But that's what I do if I get anxious and I've done that under dinner tables as well. And, and I tend to warn people about that before, you know, before we've had our starter because uh, you know, if, you, if you're rubbing your feet under the table, people start thinking all sorts of things. So I do warn people about that one. Um, but yeah, I need a dark room, I need space alone, I need it quiet. Um, and and I, I find it quite, I've been working very hard lately and also um, trying to catch up on everything that was um, not happening in April, which is obviously all, a lot of things happening now in October, November. So I'm working very hard. I'm also moving house and training a dog for my daughter. So I've, I've been, really really up against it and uh my eldest daughter said oh you know should we watch a movie tonight and I had to say no and I felt dreadful because I said I'm so sorry but I just need to go to my room it's like eight o'clock at night I just need to go to my room and turn the light off and wake up in the morning and we you know I just need time alone and it as a parent it's it's a horrible guilt you know when you have to say no to things as simple as that um so it's it's it, you know it's it's not something which I'm blasé about it you know it's really difficult um, so third question, I put them on my phone, sorry. Third question, you talk about badly worded questions, um, which get an unexpected reply. Do you have examples? I do have examples. So um, sometimes we, there are metaphors and, and phrases, which if I say them, they make perfect sense. But sometimes if other people say them to me, I, I, I will say the wrong answer. So for, 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 an, for an example, um, and a household appliance has broken down and someone says to me, oh gosh, you know, that was terrible timing because of, uh, you know, lockdown or whatever. And I'll say, oh yes, actually it was terrible timing, it's 6.30 in the afternoon. But, you know, rather than understanding that that was actually just a statement rather than a question. Um, rhetorical questions are kind of lost on me. Um, so if anyone does ask me a rhetorical question, I need to, um, I need someone to go, that was a rhetorical question. I don't expect it, you know, a, a, an information based <laughs> answer. Um, another one which I've always found tricky is, um, okay, let's say it's Sunday and you say to me, can't I can't wait to meet you and that's I'm um, really looking forward to seeing you next Thursday so I'm going to go oh, brilliant next Thursday when is the next Thursday the next Thursday is in four days so I'll see them in four days and I turn up a week early because actually what people mean when they say see you next Thursday often is that they mean I will see you Thursday week so that's not four days that's about thir 13 days you know so it's a week away um, and I always find that difficult. And that's not, I mean, it's inconvenience if you've got um, plans with friends because you're there early and in your opinion, they're, they're late. But um, but it's it's even bigger consequences when you're a parent. And that could have been parents' evening or it could have been a really important dental appointment or something. So I always have to have everything written down um, explicitly. 
So, you know, Thursday, the 16th of November or whatever, you know, and at what time rather than I can't just have it um, verbally. I have to have that written down. Um, so, so that's a bit tricky. Um, fourth question here. You mentioned about safeguarding being one of your things. It is. I'm a slash obsessed with, uh, with safeguarding. Can you give some examples of where autistic girls and women are particularly vulnerable and suggest some resources? Yes, we are vulnerable in many ways. Um, part of being diagnosed as autistic can mean that you, you have difficulty with social imagination. Now, when somebody says, oh, difficulty of imagination, we, we might think, oh, well, that's a bit rubbish because we know lots of autistic people that can write poetry, they're good authors, they're artists, they're actresses, all this stuff which takes an awful lot of imagination. Inventors, that's imaginative until it's happened. So, um, but that, that's just traditional imagination. Social imagination is very different. That's understanding what happens next in a social situation, be that a party, be that a classroom, be that a university lecture, be that um, a WhatsApp group message. I cannot do WhatsApp group messages. In fact, I was on a, I don't know if it was WhatsApp or Facebook group messages, but a group message. Um, and everyone was talking about a hen party. Um, and I'm following this conversation thinking, oh, that's nice for them. I didn't even understand that I was invited, so I, I didn't reply because I just I couldn't keep up with it. I didn't understand that. You know, I need someone to be quite direct with me. Uh, and, and on a one to one situation, I'm normally um, quite fluent and, and, can, and can gauge things. But, but on a bigger scale, I can't. Um, and even one to one, I, I find it difficult. So that, that can make us quite vulnerable in friendship groups. It can make us vulnerable in dating. We might not be able to see the agenda of what might happen next. My, the way I, I, I try and help non-autistic parents slash carers understand the autistic young person they're supporting or indeed bringing up um, is to play the game consequences, the paper game. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever played it before. You get a bit of paper and you write a name. So uh, I don't know, a man's name, fold over the bit of paper, pass that so the other person can't see, pass it to your partner, they write a girl's name, and then you write a story, but folding it each time so you're only getting your information. And, um, and, and then at the end you unravel it and you think this story, God didn't predict that to happen. And that's a bit like, well, for me and for many of the people I support, that's what it's like being autistic, only getting your version of events and not really seeing what could happen next. And it's very puzzling. Um, so I've got many strategies for that. I've got a, an app, a phone app, which I've made during lockdown. It's completely free. It's, it's available uh, globally on all Apple phones, iPads, watches, all Android, tablets, phones. It's, um, so if you went into your Google Play or Apple Store and you put in um, Visual Pain Images UK, that will come up and you can download that completely free. And what's what's on that is not only stuff to help us if we become non-verbal when we're unwell, such as visual pain images, it's all literally images of what pain could look like. Um, so like uh, there's like lightning, you know, for like a splitting headache or a toothache, um, creepy crawlies, for that kind of crawling nerve pain, it, all sorts on there. Um, and you can literally click onto those and it, the audio of me speaking what it is will come up. So if you can't talk um, or if somebody's visually paired and autistic, they can hear it. Um, so try to do a bit, bit of universal design there. But, but the reason I'm uh, speaking about that is on there, I've put my um, online course, which I wrote in 2015, which is called Boundaries, Bodies, Abuse and Reporting It. I've added that as a free resource onto that app. Um, and, and there's lots of strategies for, um, for autistic women and girls um, and indeed boys, boys use it too, um, um, to try and help understand why our safeguarding issues can be, can be a little bit different. So what's the next question on here? Five, do you feel that autistic mothers receive enough support? Um, yes and no, it's definitely got better than it used to be. Um, being an, an autistic mother, well, back in my girls are a bit older now, but back in kind of 2008 ish time, people, first of all, didn't even believe that my daughters were autistic. Um, so that was challenging as well because people assumed I was a liar. And by people, I mean professionals, teachers. I you know I was told, you know, it's impossible for you to have two autistic daughters, I, only boys are autistic, things like that was what I was met with. So, um, so then I had to take the leap of actually 
obviously I was diagnosed after them and, uh, and, and then disclosing that on top. So actually we were incredibly misunderstood um, and the support was kind of minimal. I, um, I worked with Cambridge University and Dr. Alexa Paul and a group, there was a group of us on an advisory board of AMW, an advisory board um, for autistic motherhood. And we tried to explain what it was like to be really misunderstood, particularly by professionals. And some of the women spoke about social services intervention and things like that. Um, we, people are very quick to misjudge. So for example, if, you have, if you're an autistic woman and you have an autistic child and your child really only enjoys wearing a certain tracksuit, which they've had for ages and you've brought a whole wardrobe of new clothes, but they don't want to wear them yet. They're, they're insistent on wearing what now looks probably like a quite worn, scruffy um, tracksuit. People aren't going to look at you in the streets and go, wow, there's a mum that's, you know, letting her child have a nice sensory pain-free day. They're going to look at, see, think neglect. And, and understanding what I try to describe as that autistic culture um, and things being not always what they might look like immediately. Um, so I, I think things can be very difficult. Um, I, things are better than they are, but there, there's still some challenges. So, for example, in family law, that can be very hard for autistic mums, particularly if they're in a divorce and there's custody battles. Um, I, I know of one um, or several, but, but one sticks out permanently in my mind um, of a, a, an autistic mother who was asked in court. Um, so you've been on a parenting course. What was the best thing you got out of it? So the mum said, oh, I've met another woman like me. I don't feel so isolated and alone anymore. And actually, we're going to meet up at the weekend, which was then written down in her court notes as mum um, has no concept of child's needs before her own. But of course she did. That wasn't what she was asked. What she should have been asked is, so you've been on a parenting course. What was the best strategy you learned for your parenting here forth? And she would have gone, oh, well, actually, I've learned about this and I've learned about that. But that wasn't what they asked her. So she answered the question very honestly and very clearly. And that had huge consequences, life changing consequences. Um, so when it comes to um, court cases, autistic um, mums, autistic women or just autistic people in general, there needs to be a lot more help with the intermediary supports. A lot of the time, um, if autistic people ask for extra support, in a court case, be that as a witness, a victim or a defendant, or in family courts, um, that it's often that they've just, they're just given everything in larger text or an easy read, but actually it's somebody explaining what the question is. Very, very difficult. Um, yeah, really, really tricky. So, uh, question six. Do you think enough is being done to identify and support autistic women in general? Um, yes and no. It's still a postcode lottery. It's so much different than it was t 10 odd years ago. I mean, it's, it's the landscape has completely changed for the better, but there still needs to be um, better understanding of autistic women who aren't white. Uh, in 2015, I, I got a phone call in the middle of the night, young lady I was supporting, sadly she tried to take her own life. Her mother called me. And said, I'm sorry to call you in the middle of the night. Um, my, my daughter's um, being sectioned. However, the room she's in, um, it's, and it's the middle of the night, the TV's on and they've got bright lights. And please just ring the head nurse and let her know that she's autistic. She's not listening to me. So I, I rang the head nurse and I said, um, and it, it wasn't down south, it was in the Midlands. And I, I said, um, this, this young woman that you're dealing with um, is autistic. She's in enough distress as it is. Please make it sensory friendly, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the head nurse said to me, she can't possibly be autistic. And I can't, why? And basically, because she was black, which is just mind boggling. Now that's 2015. So there needs to be a heck of a lot more of understanding um, about autistic women that aren't white and that autism isn't male, isn't always male, and it isn't always pale more challenges to be had, a bit of a postcode lottery still as well. Question number seven, have you got any tips for autistic mothers? Oh gosh, I don't know whether I'd be, able... <laughs> I don't think my children would agree that I might be the, the best person to give tips for other mothers just in general. Um, tips for autistic mothers. Um, actually, yes. Be very confident about the fact you're autistic. 
And when you are dealing with uh, any types of professionals, before you even start, disclose that you're autistic and let them know what that might mean for you. Because if you don't, there's going to be even greater room for misunderstanding. So as I was talking about how we can um, uh, sometimes struggle with understanding, oh, that appointment on Thursday, is that in four days time or is that in 13 days time? If, if we don't say, I need the dates written down by email explicitly because I'm going to get a bit confused or I'm, I'm going to misinterpret what you're saying, um, they're then just going to mark you down. Oh, didn't turn up for the dentist. Oh, didn't turn up for this. You know, be really confident about it. And that's very, very hard, particularly if you feel that people might be judging you a bit. But that's very hard. Be very confident about it uh, and be tooled up, not literally with tools. That would be a bit aggressive. Tooled up. So if, if somebody was going to say, oh, well, you're... Um, you're autistic and your child's autistic, but they're great here. They're only autistic at home. Make sure that you've got all the research on masking X, Y, Z printed off um, and reach out to advocates and ambassadors as well, because we're here to support the best we can. Um, and that's all of my questions. But if there's any more, I'm happy to uh, happy to fill up the next seven minutes, eight minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Carly. Um, I think we do have one or two questions. Uh, I'll just ask Jenny if we've we've got anyone uh, yeah. with a question. Yeah, so um, I've got two questions. Uh, do you want them one at a time? Yes, please. Yeah. So um, the first question is, what advice would Carly give to an undiagnosed parent to help them to get through the parent blaming period when trying to get a diagnosis for their child? Oh, gosh. So parent is undiagnosed, child is also undiagnosed. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, a good clinician will know that it runs in the family. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's come from mum or dad. I like to call autism DNA roulette. It could be someone's aunt or, or you know. Um, so hopefully they'll be clued up enough to, to give support. Um, but the blame game, yes, that's exactly how it feels. If you haven't already disclosed to the doctor who you're um, seeking a diagnosis for your young person, also disclose to them that you're seeking your own diagnosis. People can be judgmental that um, what you're doing is absolutely the right thing because when people have their diagnosis for, for themselves or for their young person, it's almost as if like a, a hole in the soul is replaced. We get our self-esteem back. We get or we can start working towards self-esteem because it's, it's you can't really have self-esteem without self-identity. And if you haven't got your self-identity, where's your, where's your starting point? Um, it, also having our diagnosis can safeguard us because we understand our vulnerabilities better and so do other people. So, um, so you're doing exactly the right thing um, if you're having challenges actually getting a diagnosis which really understands autistic women and girls, um, I, I, I do know from some people that I supported that they've been able to ask their uh, GP for special funding to go to, to a place that will, that will be able to understand their autism, so such as the Lorna Wing Centre. I know people that have had special funding from their GP to go private. So definitely ask for that and see what can be done because it, it has happened for some people I know. Brilliant, thank you. And um, the next question was, um, it was from someone who said, I'm fascinated by Carly's work with women in the justice system and social services. Are there any organisations providing advocacy to autistic women um, in, in that area around justice system and social services? I think, most advocates will help out with with anything to do with courts be that being there in person um, or being that helping them with witness statements um so there i, I don't know of a charity slash organization that's doing that just as their one thing but um but if you could find an or autistic Mackenzie's friend or just emailing advocates and saying this is what I'm up against can you help me or know some, someone who does. Um, autism although it's fast it's also a small world advocacy wise so if somebody can't be that person to be there to quite literally hold your hand and help um, they will know someone that can so reach out to independent advocates but yeah I don't know of I could be wrong but I, I can't think off the top of my head of a charity that's doing just that but if there needs to be one. That's really helpful. Thank you. My hand back over to you, David. Yeah, OK, thank you very much, Carly, for that. Interestingly, mm -hmm. you mentioned about uh, talking about justice uh, system and what have you there. We've recently on the Hampshire Autism Partnership Board been uh, looking at 
the support that can be given by appropriate adults when people get arrested and, and how well informed are they of autism. So it's something we're following up at the moment because uh, that's another important thing that needs to be got right, really. But, um, Hugely. Yeah. Oh, just reminding me, David, there is some, there is, um, I think they're called the NAPP, I think it's the National Association, sorry, NAAP, National Association of Appropriate Adults. There's a Twitter, they've got a Twitter account and they seem to be doing good work with regards to appropriate adults. Um, but, but yeah, I will, uh, that's going to be now my task is to find if there is a charity slash organisation that purely helps out in intermediary um, for, for autism, but um but yeah, there, there are a few people on Twitter that, that have organisations, so I'll um I might ping things back to you once I found out. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Okay, well, thank you ever so much, Carly. Uh, same as with Lee for you know for pre-recording your talk and coming and joining us today. Really appreciate it, and and I know a lot of stuff there that people are going to take on board. So uh, huge thanks to you. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Have a great day, guys. We'll keep in touch. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, bye. Okay, so now we move on to some good news stories from our ambassadors. As some of you all know, we've asked ambassadors to send in short videos um, and a few of you have been brave enough to do so. Um, this is just a, a just a short snippet of the good things that are going on, but we're just going to play the video to you now. Hi, I'm Holly and this year I was awarded a place on a doctoral training programme to research autistic people's facial expressions and how they use them to communicate and how other people, particularly non-autistic people, read those facial expressions. Um, I'm really excited to be an autistic person in autism research and I'm really hoping that this research can help non-autistic people to understand autistic people's facial expressions, how they use them to communicate and, um, and contribute to our understanding of autistic communication in general. Hi everyone, um, so as well as helping um, parents and um, students in the local area as I've done for quite a few years now, uh, I answered a kind of plea on our Facebook group for somebody to talk to the Southampton University trainee teachers. Um, about being a neurodiverse teacher so I ran a session it was going to be at Southampton University but with lockdown we had to do it remotely in the end um, and it was really really well received the student teachers who are now qualified teachers and going into their first workplaces uh, really appreciated finding out what strategies they could use, what support was available, um, how useful access to work could be, what reasonable adjustments they could request, all of those sorts of things. Um, so the feedback was really, really good. I really enjoyed doing it as well. I, I kind of felt I was sharing some information that isn't easily available and isn't widely available to um, autistic teachers generally because it's not something that many teachers would talk about. Um, and they've asked me to run a session again for the current academic year, um, but much earlier on in the year because they thought it would be useful for those student teachers to be aware of um, what might help them early on. Um, so I'm going to do that in October. Okay. Hi, my name is Bryony Allen and um, I work for Leighton's Opticians and Hearing Care as Professional Services Manager. As an Autism Ambassador last year, I worked with our Ellen, uh, Learning and Development Manager to create an e-learning module all about autism for every single staff member within our company. We looked at what autism is, what it isn't, we did some myth busting and we looked at how we can better support our patients, adults and children with autism um, as part of our eye care and hearing care services. Hi, my name's Paula. I am the ambassador at Brisbane Infant School. I've been their ambassador for almost four years now and I'm really enjoying it. Each year it gets a little bit easier um, to get things put in place and um, we're definitely getting more of a voice within the schools, both infants and juniors. 
we've been particularly focusing on personalised support for individual pupils and, and, and their families. Um, this could mean anything from um, just children having a time out pass or a sensory pack, um, visual timetables, lots of individual things that not every child will need. Um, and so we're getting to know our pupils and um, understanding their specific needs within autism, which I think is really important because it's quite often easy to just say, oh yeah, that child's autistic, let's give them a visual timetable, let's give them a workstation, and actually that's not necessarily what they need. Uh, we've also been working very closely with some of our parents. Um, they can come in and book in a meeting with me during my autism ambassador time. Um, I currently have sort of an hour a week dedicated to that and that's hopefully going to go up um, to at least two, um, possibly three or four once the um, COVID problem has been resolved and so school gets back to a little bit more of a normal routine. Um, talking of COVID, we've done lots of support for the children during the lockdowns, um, personalised phone calls home and strategies and resources sent home on a regular basis after talking to the families, uh, which I've been particularly pleased about. We've also encouraged a lot more understanding and awareness of autism um, through training and um, autism awareness days in school. So the children have been watching videos and being become more aware of how they can support their fellow pupils. Um, these are just a few things that I'm particularly proud of. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Hi, I'm Emma Groves. I'm an autism ambassador and I work at IBM Hursley. I'm really excited because this year I've spent a lot of time working with IBM and the National Autistic Society to devise a hiring programme. We're hoping in early 2021 to recruit two autistic interns into our Hursley lab. Hi. My name is Carly Brazier. I trained as an autism ambassador in January 2020 and I'm based in the Basingstoke area. Um, so when I first did my training, I had lots of great ideas about how I wanted to fulfil my role. But obviously this year hasn't quite gone as we expected. Um, so I wanted to explain what I've been doing over the past six months or so. So I actually work for Bernardo's Hampshire Specialist Parenting Support Service and we deliver a range of parenting programmes, usually face to face in groups. Um, and one of the programmes that we deliver is the Signet programme for ASC. Um, so this year we've been working really hard um, and the, we've managed to convert this programme so it is now available for parents and carers to complete online. Um, we use a blended approach so that we, we do um, a Zoom discussion as well so that parents can meet each other. And I'm actually, it's, it's not been easy, um, but I'm actually really proud of what we've achieved as a service. Um, and over the, the course of the past six months or so, since May, um, we've delivered 35 Signet programmes across Hampshire. Um, and with about eight parents in each group, that's enabled about 280 participants to access our, our Signet programme, which is amazing in the circumstances this year. Um, so before I finished, I wanted to share some of the positive comments that we've had from participants who've attended our groups. The weekly e-learning has been brilliant and I've learned so much. We were made to feel as if we mattered, not just another participant. It has been an incredible education and journey and I would recommend this programme to any parent of autistic children. So not very high tech way of sharing that, but really nice to, to hear those comments. Thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. Hello, I'm Michelle Rebello Tyndall. I was in Southampton, now in Dorset. I've had a really busy year this year. Uh, I was diagnosed as autistic at 42. I've been delivering uh, autism friendly training, uh, training and days at Monkey World and Farmer Palmers. I'm also working with the brilliant Bruce Tressler fellow ambassador from Hampshire Police. We're making some videos to help autistic people to contact emergency services and also to, to, to train control room staff. I have also been working really hard with Dimensions, delivering clubs for isolated people throughout the country, uh, bingo art, 
um, movies, everything um, to help people to connect online during lockdown. And I've also released a book as well called Life Will Never Be Dull. Uh, I illustrated this for Deborah Brownson, who wrote He's Not Naughty, and we worked together to create a book that was just uh, about the surprising and, and lovely aspects of um, raising a family in a bunkers household, and it actually mentions Autism Ambassador on the book as well. Uh, very proud to be one. Thank you very much. Hello, um, I'm Sue Seymour. I'm an Autism Ambassador, and I'm Gosport's Autism Ambassador. I'm on the committee of the Gospel and Fair and Disability Forum. Um, at the moment, during COVID, we've had a lot of people come to us because um, with autism because they're getting refused places to go into because they're not wearing masks. Um, so we've had to talk to like landlords and things to try and be a go-between for that and try and sort things out. Um, just before lockdown, I was invited into Halifax. Um, bank down the town in Gosport. I went in the office and different staff while they weren't working came in to talk about autism and see if there was anything they could like do there to be more autism friendly with um, customers and that. Um, they were all quite interested. Um, then I had a table where the customers are and quite a few came over like either had children with autism or knew someone that had autism. So they were quite interested. Um, and I did get invited back on just after, uh, just before COVID shut down. So that didn't happen, but I will be doing it again when we're allowed out properly. <laughs> um, I got invited back to that and I'll be at Santander as well. They've asked me to have a table there for an afternoon or a morning. Carolyn Dynage is going to come along as well to try and help promote um, the autism friendly bit in Gosport. Um, the other thing I've been doing is helping Autism Hampshire update their website um, to make it a bit more easy read and update things like the triad to the dyad and different things. Um, that's been quite a bit of work because it's quite big and an ongoing thing. Um, and I've also been on Facebook autism sites and been asked to like be moderator in that and help the parents and adults with autism um, answering some of their questions. Um, and that's been quite successful because I've had a lot of private messengers saying thank you, they've tried something with their child and it's worked or it's helped. So that's the other thing I've been doing during lockdown when I can't get out and actually physically do things. So I'm still trying to work through things like that. Hello, I'm Rachel Carter and I work at Ordnance Survey where I'm also an Autism Ambassador. One of the things that I've done is to set up a Yammer Autism Support Network. Earlier this year, I changed this to a Neurodiversity Support Network which has attracted more members. This has been particularly useful during lockdown as most of our staff are working from home. I've also worked with the HR inclusion and diversity officer on policy and recruitment related things. Again, earlier this year, we ran some understanding autism in the workplace workshops. These were really well attended and we had quite a number of representatives from HR and recruitment involved in those. Hello, I'm Steve Bond, formerly the Ambassador for the Office of National Statistics and PAL Society. Over the last year, I've been developing, along with a whole bunch of talented autistic people, a new service called What's It Like, that we're delivering with EnableAbility, a Portsmouth-based disability charity. I will let the lovely Claire introduce this service. Sophie is one of six million people living with anxiety in the UK. Like many, she cannot access the places she needs to or wants to because it is overwhelming. Sophie wants to know what's it like to prepare herself. We bridge the gap between organisations keen to improve access and inclusivity and their potential customers or clients with anxiety or autism. Our web app shows the organisation's setting, allowing people like Sophie to familiarise themselves before visiting. 
The app uses a gradual approach tailored to each individual's pace with clinical support if required. Our app includes virtual tours with short video clips of key people, 360 degree videos, and a virtual reality headset experience at the venue on a quiet day to experience the crowds without the crowds. The What's It Like team all have direct experience of anxiety or autism that we harness to design solutions for our communities. The past four months, we've been creating immersive content to help people who live with anxiety access health appointments and have worked with the Portsmouth CAMS service, a child development centre and two GP practices. Here you can see a virtual tour that we've created for Falcon House CAMS that allows people to explore the place in their own time, to meet some of the staff and to understand how patients are being kept safe with coronavirus. We have also created a Makaton version of this tour which shows the signs for each room and has a signer from NHS Solent that provides the informational content. Perhaps most exciting of all, along with two very talented autistic video producers, I have recently achieved my dream of setting up a social firm to support autism employment. I hope that you hear a lot more about this in the coming years as we develop and grow. Remember the name, Autec. Well, there we go. There's some thoughts and, and ideas of what our ambassadors have been doing. And, and thank you to everybody who sent in a video. I know it's quite daunting to do your own video, but uh, we really do appreciate you sending in those those videos. But of course, we know there are loads and loads of other things that ambassadors are doing across the region, and we're, we're very grateful for them. So we're almost at the end now, and we just want to talk about some sort of future thoughts for the scheme. We want to make sure that we are sustainable so we can keep the scheme running and and we can keep it growing. That's so important. One idea that we've had, and this is where we want to try this technology now to see if it works. One suggestion has been that we perhaps have occasional online meetings of ambassadors where groups of ambassadors can get together just to chat online about everything. If you think that's a feasible idea, could you just click the little hand tool at the top of your bar so that will give us an instant look to see how many people think that's not a bad idea. I can see it's going up now, actually. Some of you will know we've had some regional get togethers of ambassadors as well, but this may be a way in these COVID times to be able to get people together online and, and have the occasional meeting where you can drop in and have a chat. Oh, we've got 50, 51, 52. Oh, yes, loads of you like the idea. That is brilliant. Thank you very much for that. We'll see what we can do on that one and see if we can get something sorted out. So many thanks for voting on that and the technology worked. Brilliant. We want to try and get more ambassadors networking on Facebook. That's become quite important in these COVID times that uh, where we can't meet. So please use our Facebook page. If you're not a member, join it. Vanessa will let you in and we can chat on Facebook as well. We want to try and attract more ambassadors from shops, community leisure, employers into the scheme. So please spread the word as, as we always ask you to do. And of course, we want to build the scheme based on your feedback because it's your feedback that actually keeps the scheme running as, as we need it to be. So thank you for that. After today's conference, which as you'll appreciate, it's been quite a different conference. We'd love to have your feedback. What did you enjoy? What could we improved on? What would you like us to do for next year's conference, assuming it might be online or it might be in person? Who knows? So please send your comments back to us. Vanessa will send you a feedback link where you can put your, your, your feedback on. And of course, the one thing to remember is uh, the smallest of actions can make the biggest difference. And you'll probably find that everyone will benefit from those actions, not just autistic people. As Lee was saying, this is not exclusively for autistic people. This is for everybody. And then we don't discriminate. OK, so we're nearly there now. And finally, we just want to say a big thank you to all of you, because we couldn't do all these things without what you're doing behind the scenes every day throughout the last year. One thing I didn't mention earlier, which you will have heard about, is the fact that we were a finalist in the National Autistic Society's Autism Professional Awards, which is actually where we met Lee and Carly earlier in the year. We went up to Birmingham. We didn't win, but we were in the top three of the most inspirational community project. And we've had lots of people contacting us from all over the country about the scheme. I presented to branches in the National Autistic Society back in November last year. And everyone was saying, oh, can we have a scheme? We want a scheme. So let's hope the idea spreads, not just within our own region. Thank you again for what you're doing. 
please keep doing them and please keep sending in your good news stories because we love to hear what's going on. And once again, huge thank you to Lee and to Carly for their input into this year's conference and to all my colleagues who've been busily working way behind the scenes to actually make sure the technology actually has worked. And on the whole, I think it has, um, it does seem to have worked quite well. So thank you all very much. Um, we'll see you again next year, uh, hopefully in person, who knows? Um, but meanwhile, we'll keep in touch. We'll try and get uh, uh, some online meetings in the uh, agenda and we'll keep you informed of what's going on. So thank you all. Have a good rest of your day and see you again soon. Bye bye.